Shalom, good evening. This is TV7 Israel News broadcast to you from Jerusalem and in today's top stories. Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz voices confidence that Washington will not remove the RGC from its designated list of foreign terrorist organizations. Unidentified aircraft target a number of Iranian installations and warehouses in the vicinity of Damascus, and yet another deadly bombardment which Syria attributes to Israel. A senior Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps officer who was reportedly involved in planning terror attacks against Israeli civilians and targets overseas was assassinated in one of the most highly protected districts of the Iranian capital Tehran. RDF, Israel's security agency and border police special operations forces engage in counter-terrorism activity in a number of towns and so-called refugee camps in the West Bank districts of Judea and Samaria over the weekend. According to the RDF spokesperson's unit, a total of 21 suspects wanted for involvement in terrorist activities were arrested. Moreover, during operational activity that included deadly exchanges of fire, a number of weapons caches were uncovered and consequently confiscated. And while thankfully no injuries were reported among the Israeli forces, a 17-year-old Palestinian militant, a member of the Iranian proxy Palestinian Islamic Jihad, was killed while engaging in a gun battle with an Israeli special operations force. Meanwhile, Defense Minister Benny Gantz concluded a five-day trip to the United States last night, prior to which he addressed an event in New York City commemorating fallen Israeli troops whose families live in the United States. In his remarks, Jerusalem's top defense official highlighted the deep-rooted connection of the Jewish people, who are repeatedly forced to contend with powerful adversaries who seek to uproot them, yet, as in the biblical story of David and Goliath, the people of Israel overcame adversity time and again. This union of loss and triumph, sorrow and salvation, heartbreak and happiness, which cannot be separated from one another, serve as a proof that we have been fighting Goliath ever since. The Goliath that displaced us from Zion and the Goliath that expelled us from Spain, the Goliath that tried to destroy us during the Russian Empire in the 19th century, and the German Goliath that nearly succeeded in the next one. And just like David the King, the people of Israel overcame. Not only did we survive, not only did we make the desert bloom, but we also built the strongest military in the Middle East region because history showed us that we must defend ourselves by ourselves. Minister Gantz continued by highlighting that while Israel relentlessly battles its enemies for its survival, it does nonetheless do so with the hope that someday it may live peacefully beside them. The Israeli Defense Minister stressed, however, that until the day in which peace prevails, the Israeli Defense Establishment will vigorously combat anyone who seeks to harm its citizens. Jerusalem's top defense official, who met with Washington's top security brass last week, further concluded that the U.S.-Israel alliance continues to be ironclad and emphasized the importance of working to sustain this unique relationship. In facing these challenges and others, I know that our ally, the United States, has our back. I stand before you. After having met with both National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and United States Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, they reinforced my belief that Israel's closest strategic partner and friend is indeed the United States, and we must always work together.
We must always work together to protect and maintain this bond. The latter remarks by Defense Minister Gunz were made after he revealed that while Washington remains hopeful for a revival of the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran, it simultaneously remains firm against the Islamic Republic's prerequisite demand to remove the RGC from the U.S. State Department's designated list of foreign terrorist organizations. Turning to Israel's northern neighbor Syria, where a number of precision-guided missile salvos penetrated Syrian airspace on Friday night, during which a number of military installations and warehouses in the vicinity of Damascus were destroyed. The initial bombardment occurred at approximately 11 p.m. on Friday, when a missile salvo targeted a number of warehouses which local sources said were guarded by Iranian proxy militias near Damascus International Airport. In tandem, unidentified aircraft launched a number of salvos toward a number of Iranian military installations in the mountainous area near al Kiswa city, situated in Rif Damashk Governorate, in addition to another number of targets, which TV7 could not immediately corroborate, in the area of Jamraya village, north of the Syrian capital Damascus. While Syrian air defenses were activated in an attempt to intercept the incoming salvos of precision-guided munitions, extensive damage was subsequently reported in all of the targeted locations. Moreover, the Syrian Defense Ministry later confirmed that three of its air defense troops, including one officer, were killed. Meanwhile, the Damascus regime naturally pointed a blaming finger toward Israel. Nevertheless, the IDF spokesperson's unit did not confirm or deny its alleged responsibility in response to TV7's request for comment. It is important to mention, however, that all of the targets in Syria were identified as belonging to Iran, its proxies, and Syrian air defenses that sought to protect the Iranian installations. Turning to the Iranian capital, Tehran, where a senior Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps officer, who formerly operated in Syria and was reportedly involved in planning terror attacks against Israeli civilians and targets overseas, was assassinated in one of the most highly protected districts of the Iranian capital. Colonel Hassan Sayyad Khodayari was reportedly killed upon entering his vehicle that was parked next to his private residence when two armed individuals on motorback reportedly opened fire and neutralized him before fleeing the scene. Meanwhile, the RGC released a statement in which it blamed Khodayari's killing on anti-revolutionary opponents of the Ayatollah regime and stressed that the assassination of their officer in the heart of Tehran crossed all red lines and broke all of the rules. Moreover, in a televised statement, Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi highlighted the voiced frustration by veterans of the RGC who served in Syria and pledged revenge against those responsible for the assassination of Colonel Hodayari. <laughs> تردید ندارم که انتقام خونه پاک این شهید بزرگوار از دست جنایتکاران حتمی است. It is important to know that while public reports broadly insinuated Israeli responsibility for the assassination of the RGC officer, Colonel Hodayari played a central role in the Iranian drone industry placing him in the crosshairs of a string of nations throughout the Middle East and beyond, who have been subject to repeated drone attacks by Iran and its regional proxies. Turning to the Turkish city of Istanbul, where President Recep Tayyip Erdogan claimed that Ankara cannot ignore sanctions that were imposed on Turkey by Sweden, that after the Turkish military launched an operation into northern Syria in 2019. Speaking at a submarine production ceremony in Istanbul, Erdogan stressed that while Turkey is still discussing the lifting of sanctions imposed by NATO allies, it cannot accept a new member which is actively imposing punitive measures against exports of Turkey's military industry. NATO'da ve üyesi olduğumuz diğer uluslararası kuruluşlarda oynadığımız hayati rol apaçık ortadayken 
kimi müttefiklerimizle hala yaptırımların kaldırılmasını konuşuyor. Özellikle de İsveç'in şu anda bize karşı yaptırım uygulamasını hiçbir şekilde bir kenara koyamayız. Temel güvenlik hassasiyetlerinin gözetilmediği bir genişleme politikasının ne bize ne de NATO'ya hiçbir hayrının dokunmayacağına inanıyoruz. Alongside demands for lifting of sanctions, Ankara accused Helsinki and Stockholm in particular of harboring individuals linked to the internationally recognized terror group, the Kurdistan Workers' Party. Nevertheless, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg voiced confidence that a quick decision on welcoming Finland and Sweden into the alliance will be made shortly. The security interests uh, and concerns of all allies need uh, to be taken into account. Uh, and I'm confident uh, that we will come to a quick decision to welcome both Sweden and Finland to join the NATO family. Thank you for watching us. I'd like to know that TV7 Israel is a donation-based ministry. Therefore, if you're blessed by TV7's productions, please consider making a financial contribution that in turn will enable us to sustain our ongoing operations. Separately, I would like to encourage you, pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters worldwide, in addition to our unceasing prayers for the peace of Jerusalem and the salvation of Israel. I'm Jonathan Hessen wishing you a Shavua Mevorach and we will see you again tomorrow at the same time.